Um, my name is Marika Spence. I'm executive director of Impact Capital Managers, and I wanted to just take the moderator's prerogative to just take a minute of your time to describe a little bit about who ICM is, who we are, um, and who our amazing panelists are today, discussion leaders. So Impact Capital Managers, we are a membership association of a nonprofit membership association of for-profit private capital impact funds, all investing through superior returns uh, and for meaningful impact. Um, we currently have over 70 members um, that collectively represent over $15 billion in impact-focused capital at work across the United States and beyond. Um, that's over 1,100 portfolio companies, a lot of co-investing activity that's happening here. Um, and that's who we are. What we do, we connect our members to each other, like most membership organizations do. We connect them to investment opportunities and to stakeholders like LPs in the broader ecosystem. We also identify and share best practices, trying to figure out what that looks like, elevate examples um, that are really fantastic and that we can all learn from. We advocate for our members through education, research, and policy initiatives. Um, we are very happy to work with Confluence Philanthropy, IEN, the Impact, and so many others um, who are also part of the SOCAP community. And finally, last but not least, we do cultivate a skilled, diverse impact investor workforce. Um, this is just a snapshot of some of the logos you'll see here of some of the members in our community. I think probably a lot of them are quite familiar to, to many of you on the call today. And I have to put in this, I, I swear this will be more, more sharing than selling. I just wanted to put in a plug because our Mosaic Fellowship happens to be open now. This will be the third year of our program. Um, this program is a paid, a competitively paid fellowship for top performing but traditionally underrepresented grad students um, who are interested in learning the ropes of impact investing. Um, and here are some of our fellows from last summer. If you're interested, if you know somebody, um, perhaps at SOCAP, or elsewhere in your in your various lives and networks um, who might be really keen on applying, please make them aware, um, ping me with any questions after our session. Um, our impact footprint at ICM, um, we like to think of or sort of organize our impact investing activity according to four different buckets. And obviously the one we're focused on today for the next few minutes here is healthcare and wellness. Um, and these numbers here is hard to read, I know on your screen, um, they represent a, a smaller but but growing, rapidly growing, right, allocation um, in terms of our uh, memberships, portfolio companies, and their capital being deployed. And I think that this is especially over the last year and a half, we've seen this explode in other communities as well. In fact, investors. So we are joined by um, some fantastic panelists today, um, and I want to give them a, a, a shout out here before we launch in. Um, Jenny Yip, she's a managing partner at Agile Capital. Worked in finance for more than 18 years, beginning as an investment banker. Um, and in addition to managing the firm's operations and growth, Jenny oversees the firm's investments in 54G, I think is also a, a co-investment with some ICM members, if I'm not mistaken, Chroma Code uh, and Avofem Biosciences. She's a fierce advocate for women's health and serves on the Investment Advisory Committee at RIA Ventures um, and has had a, a really long uh, and fantastic stint as well at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, figuring out how private foundations can achieve their charitable objectives but through equity debt, uh, structured finance and guarantee investments in companies and investment funds. Uh, James Olson, we'll skip to the last part here, founder and managing partner at Concord Health. Uh, James has over 24 years of experience in healthcare, investment banking and investment advisory services. Prior to founding Concord in 2017, he was managing director and head of not-for-profit healthcare investment banking at Jefferies. And prior to Jefferies, MD and head of not-for-profit healthcare M&A at Merrill Lynch, where he was for 17 years. Um, he served as a trusted advisor to leading healthcare organizations, executed several billion dollars in transactions across M&A and capital markets, um, and has knowledge and experience spanning healthcare services, healthcare information technology, medical devices, and medical technology. So welcome, James. And then Roger, uh, who's a partner at Impact Engine. Um, Impact Engine is a venture capital firm. And as of the beginning of this month, I believe, Impact Engine had 22% of its investments in health-focused companies. Uh, I also like to point out that of all the companies in its direct portfolio, I think 60% are led by women CEOs or CEOs of color. Roger has a long history leading technical teams at multiple startup companies based in Chicago, most recently serving as CTO at ShopRunner. Prior to ShopRunner, he was a senior VP and CTO for Orbit. Um, Roger is also, I would like to say, board member of ICM um, and a member of our impact management and measurement working group. So with that, 
Um, I actually would like to open it up to our audience and kind of crowdsource some questions for our panelists this way before we even launch in. Um, and really pose that question to you, sort of throw it out to you. What makes you hopeful about impact investing and health and wellness today? Or conversely, maybe what gives you pause or what are you worried about? So I want to just give that, let that sit for a minute um, and sort of see if we can get some ideas and questions in our chat. I know folks have some good questions, so. Feel free to use the chat if you've got a question or a comment. Just curious about what people are excited about in terms of healthcare investing, maybe what you'd like to learn from this session or what questions you might have for our panelists that we can weave through the conversation today. All right, so people are being a little shy and that's fine or they're multitasking, I'm not gonna ask which it is. <laughs> but please feel free to, as we move through, we really wanna to try to make this an interactive session. So please just chime in, um, ask to unmute yourself. If you have a question, you really wanna make this uh, a very in as interactive as possible. Um, so with that in mind, keep that in your back pocket. And then we're going to um, pose that question a little bit to our own panelists here. So what makes a healthcare investment an impact investment? Um, and I know with the three of you, we had talked about some of these things uh, before and more, um, but I kind of wanted to boil it down to these sort of three things, right? What's that sniff test that we can all um, perhaps apply to a potential investment or a potential fund that's coming our way when we're thinking about healthcare impact investing? Um, James, I'd love for you to maybe take a crack at number one and talk about intentionality. Sure, I'd be happy to. Thank you, Marika. Um, <clears throat> very much appreciate the opportunity to speak with everybody today. Um, really excited about the topic. I'd say with respect to intentionality, uh, very, very important to really understand uh, and view the investment opportunity through the lens of impact um, and think about, at the end of the day, who is being impacted by the technology, the services, the solutions, um, really has to be mission oriented um, and in line with what I would say is sort of the future of healthcare. Where is healthcare going? Where do we need to take it? Um, and, and there really are some imperatives today that I think everybody's aware of. We need to improve quality and outcomes. We need to expand access to high quality care, but we at the same time need to control costs uh, as best as possible. And I think if you're looking through the impact lens and you uh, believe that the technology, the service, the solution of the portfolio company is uh, addressing healthcare broadly in a fair and equitable way, improving quality and outcomes, managing costs effectively, I think you know, there's a good, a, a good indication that uh, you know, it could be qualified as an impact investment. But Again, it's, it, it's quality outcomes, access to high quality care, cost and affordability, and in line with you know, where healthcare needs to go and uh, evenly impacting you know, vulnerable populations as well as everyone else. Um, so that's the way we think about it. And that's really very early up front as we're evaluating opportunities. That's, you know, that's one of our, our, our key evaluation criteria. Thanks so much, James. Roger, how do you think about uh, both intentionality but also impact management? And I think part of the reason why, I'll just really quickly say before I actually throw that to you, part of the reason why I've, I've put this third point here in blue is because I think the first two um, points here are really kind of inherent to any impact investment the way most people would define it, right? And so we want to go a level even sort of deeper or beyond to talk about what is when we're thinking about specifically healthcare investing, right? The, the unique opportunities and challenges of that sector. But maybe you can talk a little bit about impact management along with other aspects of your approach. Yeah, happy to. And thanks again for inviting me to join uh, today. Uh, yeah, I think a lot of the stuff that on impact management, you know, it can get 
complicated. Um, but at the end of the day, to me, a lot of the things that um, James mentioned around the intentionality are the things that we want to quantify. Um, outcomes at the end of the day are what matter to us. And uh, what's interesting, though, is you know, we, we, a lot of our investments start early stage. And so maybe we don't know the outcomes, but we have a theory for how that will positively impact uh, patients. And so I think at the beginning, it's a lot more proxy measures. Um, and in, as well as we kind of break it down into three dimensions of scale, efficacy, and access. And we would like to have at least one quantifiable metric that our companies can report on um, so that we can see that directionally they're headed towards that ultimate outcome of a positive patient, um, positive patient outcome. Great. And Jenny, maybe you could take number three uh, and feel free to address the other two as well and beneficiaries. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so at Adjuvant Capital, we're a life sciences investment fund focused on tackling global health challenges. And so what we mean by that is we invest in mid to late clinical stage companies doing R&D on drugs, vaccines, medical devices, and diagnostics. And, and I think what really differentiates Adjuvant is actually this question on end beneficiaries. Um, because while most of our portfolio is still domiciled in the US and Europe, because that's where the clinical innovations are, our target population, our target patients, uh, have to include those living in lower middle income countries. So we think oftentimes times about increasing health access, healthcare equity, uh, not just for patients in the U.S. or Europe, uh, but really for patients uh, that are living in, in um, you know, low resource settings uh, and low income people in low resource settings. Um, so, you know, talk about intentionality, right? Because um, when we're developing our bespoke investment thesis, um, our intention uh, and hopefully our outcomes will, will be that uh, we're increasing uh, patient outcomes um, for those who need it most. Great, thanks so much. And I mean, I wanna, I've noticed that there's some, some really interesting comments and questions coming through in the chat as well. And I wanna make sure that we kind of address those throughout and don't let them um, get stale. So I'm, I'm just kind of curious, I mean, Hal, you've got a good question here around sort of thinking about um, profit and perhaps sort of a potential trade-off between impact and return um, and when, when healthcare is involved. So um, I wonder if, if you all, if the panelists can see that in the chat on the right, um, perhaps addressing that question um, you know, if there is that kind of trade-off or, or not, what you see from your perspective. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take that. Um, I, look, I, I think it depends on the profits that you're seeking, right? So you can either make, you know, a, a lot of profit and a lot of margin on a small volume, or you can make a, a very, very small margin on a large volume. Um, and I think the way that we think about global health investing is if you're trying to impact the most number of people, you may only be making 50 cents or a dollar on a unit of vaccines um, that gets administered in routine immunizations around the world. But those, those cohorts of births or, or children who are getting uh, these regular vaccines are in the tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of units. Um, so I, I think Yes, there's going to be certain aspects of healthcare where you are absolutely trading off profits for, for impact. Um, but I also think that there are certain niches in healthcare where you don't have to make that trade off and you can kind of have your cake and eat it too. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, Jenny. I think that's a great point. I think at the end of the day, it boils down to it's important to have a viable business plan at the end of the day, right? So if you can generate maybe a smaller profit a large, uh, across a large population, that could be very viable. In other situations, you've got to balance it a little bit differently. But in order for them to be successful businesses, they do have to generate a profit, reinvest in the business and expand uh, so they can have a broader, deeper impact on the populations that they're trying to treat and care for. And James, actually, while you're on that, um, I wanted to ask you too, I mean, somebody had a question here around sort of uh, pen penetrating an established market. And it made me think of one of the things we've all talked about in the past too, around sort of the elephant in the room, which is sometimes government, right? And so the role of government and policy vis-a-vis -vis health companies uh, and all that regulation and so on and that shifting landscape. So, you know, what, what do you see as the kind of the unique opportunities and challenges of working in that type of really highly regulated market? Sure, it, it, it is complex. So first and foremost, uh, 
it's a, it's a complex industry and environment. The, the government is is obviously heavily involved. They're the biggest payer in the industry, right? So you really have to understand the policy and the dynamics and different administrations obviously have different uh, uh, thoughts on how best to um, develop policy and, and the regulatory environment and so forth. But it is a balance and you really need to understand what the nuances are and the expectations for the future in terms of reimbursement. And you need to be ahead of changes in policy so that you can help the company's position for success. That requires a pretty deep understanding of the broader um, macro issues such as policy and, and the regulatory environment. And so healthcare is difficult uh, in the sense that you need to have sort of a deep knowledge. And to the extent that there are people who have healthcare expertise, I think that's going to be very beneficial operating in this particular environment with the changes that are sometimes outside of the control of the company and the, and the entrepreneurs. Roger, any, any thoughts on that in terms of government and yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think it's, yeah, I think James laid it out. It's like, they're the largest player, so you can't ignore it. Um, I think we, we have companies that directly go after opportunities that are created um, because of Medicaid programs. Uh, we have other players that, strangely enough, you know, have a lot more traction with commercial payers. And then over time, they grow their business to address like a Medicare market. Um, and, and so we kind of see it in every direction. You're always aware of what policy will dictate. I think COVID has brought up opportunities that people didn't expect because of relaxation of policy. Um, you know, telehealth as an ex obvious example of just the explosion there because um, relaxation of rules requiring in-person visits um, and that kind of disruption, you know, is seldom happens <laughs> um, immediately with government. Um, but I do think it's interesting, you know, it's a little bit like once the you know, we've kind of opened that box and I don't think you're going to put it completely back to the way it was. Um, I, I do actually want to address the whole profit thing. Um, I, I mean, you have to remember, you know, a lot of the healthcare providers in this country are not for profit providers. But, um, you know, what's your definition of profit in those cases? We still have hospital system CEOs that make $5 million. Is that... You know, these are not for profit organizations. And so I, I think when I think about our companies and their profits, you know, their early stage investments, they reinvest those profits to grow. Um, you know, they ask for investors who, you know, want to return. But those profits help us grow, help these companies grow. And if we did our jobs right as they grow, there's more positive impact being produced by these companies. And they can grow at a faster rate because you know, people see the opportunity for these companies to gain value. And so I don't see that inherent conflict that a lot of people do. Um, but maybe this is a juicy conversation for every so cap. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and maybe I could just add one more thing on the role of government. Um, I think we think of oftentimes the government as a payer, as a customer that you're ultimately selling into or providing services. But, you know, from, from my perspective, because we are a life sciences investment fund, there are a lot of push and pull incentives to get these clinical innovations out into the market as well. And so, you know, we oftentimes work with, you know, BARDA, DARPA, NIH, all the alphabet soup organizations of the U.S. government to actually de-risk some of the, the technical and clinical aspects of our investment. Um, not only is that a huge stamp of approval because they're world-renowned scientists at these organizations helping guide these companies forward, um, but it's also you know, non-dilutive funding that can then de-risk certain projects. So that's kind of the push of, of, of you know, gov role of government. The pull incentives is also just it, the government acting as a customer exactly to what, what Roger and James was saying. So I want to recognize that you know, governments broadly speaking can play multiple roles within the healthcare ecosystem. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I wanted to ask too, and I think this is a question that um, has has come up. I, I feel like it's, it's not the elephant in the room, but it's definitely top of mind for a lot of folks right now. Is, is Theranos, for example? I just want to put that example out there. It's a very flashy, um, well-covered example, right? And you know, Roger, we talked about this earlier around sort of well, what 
would, would that have been considered an impact investment? Obviously, it, it's it's a bad apple, right? It, it kind of it went quite horribly pear shaped um, to use more fruit metaphors. But so, how how would you would you would you think about that? And like, are there lessons to be learned there as, as an impact investor? And have we? I guess the larger question is, you know, is there a concern that we've all woken up and said, oh, all healthcare investing is impact investing. Of course, we're we're saving lives, as Aaron mentions here in the chat. Like, kind of how are we really what is that differentiation for you? I know we've touched on it before, but I I mean the idea and the concept is certainly compelling of being able to provide diagnostics you know, in some, it's pretty revolutionary idea. And so I think the fault of the investors, I would assume is, and probably the company was that, well, it actually didn't work. And so, you know, having read Bad Blood, it's like, I, I would expect that any of us would do more diligence than just sort of trust us, it works. Um, right. And I think that, that goes back to that continuous engagement of like, you know, I think we 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 refine our impact measures over time as the company has more data and more support for the efficacy, and, and I would expect the buyers would need the same thing. Um, that that's that was our assumption going in that the buyers wanted to have proof that the thing works, and clearly that that did not happen. So yeah. um, it's it's a cautionary reminder, but I wouldn't say that I don't see it as necessarily inherently something that ruined the industry in any way. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Theranos was just plain fraud. <laughs> so, and there's fraud in in almost any any. Industry. Um, and so, yeah, the idea was great, but it just like there was no science behind it and no data behind it, and that was the issue. Yeah, I, I also think. I mean, I, I think we're actually we to some extent we are opening our eyes to healthcare in, in, in a different way. Um, one of the things that we think about, though, is we're looking for those opportunities that are not just incremental benefits and changes. Yeah. This company has something that is meaningful or significant in terms of the opportunity to impact. Um, and so there is that gradation, if you will, of, of um, what is the impact relative to the status quo today for that particular technology or solution. And um, But I think healthcare is is it's it's opening up uh in terms of the opportunities around impact and, and i'm i'm excited about that i also think the industry is uh at least from my perspective and my see what i've seen is greater engagement and support for innovation uh there seems to be more of a culture of innovation uh in the industry more adoption um and and that's really a phenomenal thing to see there were there for many years it was really kind of protecting the status quo and it feels like things are opening up and we're seeing the emergence of some wonderful new technologies that can make a difference. And, um, and so I'm excited about where we are right now, but I do think there's going to be a lot of opportunities in healthcare. Yeah. I'm kind of, you know, curious, like you've talked about that future healthcare system, right. And that being a litmus test a little bit for you, James, around sort of what is this investment going to move us closer to our goal of, you know, a, a modern and equitable and improved healthcare system? Or is it going to maybe keep us in a status quo or maybe even take us back? And, you know, we've talked about like the healthcare system maybe being so far behind, you know, for the United States in any case, being sort of a first world or, you know, country. Um, like, what, I'm curious why you think we are so, we have been so antiquated um, and we haven't, you know, we haven't had the right, what are the, what have been the roadblocks, right? For those sort of innovations that we're seeing now. Well, um, and again, I'm, I'm more focused on healthcare services, tech enabled services and he healthcare technology. So not necessarily speaking to life sciences and biotech and, and pharma, that's, that's a little bit different, but Within healthcare services and, and, and technology, I think one of the most significant changes is electronic medical records. Um, I think that's sort of the, that has been the basic plumbing, if you will, and the infrastructure that is required for all these new uh, ancillary technologies that are emerging, um, whether it's, you know, frankly, you know, virtual care, data analytics, and all kinds of new um 
innovations, it, it couldn't happen without that basic plumbing in place, which is electronic medical records. Great. And Roger, Jenny, care to weigh in on sort of what the, some of the reasons are that we've been sort of slower to innovate perhaps in some of the economies in this space? Yeah, so I guess from my perspective, because I, I am, you know, more on the life sciences side and research and research and development, I actually take a little bit of the opposite approach because like look at our mRNA vaccines that hopefully most of us have by now. That that took eleven months from when the sequence was was, you know, kind of announced to the world to actually an FDA EUA. Like that is phenomenal. And if you compare that to kind of prior vaccines that were developed that took years, if not a decade or more, um, I I become very, very optimistic uh, and hopeful uh, that some of these paradigm shifts that you need in kind of clinical innovation uh, will, will continue. Uh, but I also recognize that I'm in a segment of healthcare that actually depends on clinical innovation to work. Um, and I might have a different perspective than James and Roger. I, I think I feel yeah, I similar to, to Jenny in, in that uh, obviously we're capable of remarkable innovation when the needs demand. Um, but, but I'm also, um, you know, not as optimistic on the public health side, our ability to kind of roll out effective treatments and, um, you know, innovations that work and are cost effective and the barriers to getting those to market you know, is as much of the picture um, that gives the perception of things being slow. Um, and, and you know, at the end of the day, I think maybe there's an element of people, the way we communicate, like, you know, our roles in the system. Um, and I think actually I see that a lot of our companies, like the communication of what they're actually selling and how it's better than other options or for particular populations. Um, I think that that's, that continues to be a challenge with healthcare is like just a communication with patients um, who, who could benefit. So, so Roger, that's, that's one of the areas that I was thinking about as I was talking about technology and healthcare services and, and tech enabled services. I think life sciences to Jetty's point is very different. Um, within healthcare technology, digital health, for example, it really couldn't happen prior to having electronic medical records and all the basic technology in place. But now we're seeing incredible innovation around digital health and digital patient engagement. For some reason, healthcare services has been right, 15, 20 years behind, whether it's the auto industry or luxury, travel, you go down the list, right? you've been able to do things very easily through your phone or a laptop. Healthcare has been a laggard in that respect. And I think now it's opening up and we're starting to see some great, great progress in that respect. So I'm a little more hopeful in how we will in the future engage with patients and truly impact, you know, their healthcare and health wellness and, and preventative care as well. Um, virtual care is, I think, a, you know, a, a big step forward and, um, you know, with COVID, as you mentioned earlier, the genie's kind of out of the bottle with telemedicine and virtual care and digital engagement. Hospital at home um, is, is, a, is a very effective way to provide higher quality care in a better setting at a lower cost. And that leveraging technology to engage with the patient in new ways that has never been done before, I, I think we're going to be able to really make a difference in, in the quality of care. And if I could add on to that, you know, one of the things that there's like structural inefficiencies in the way our healthcare system works in that the payers don't know what you're being treated for until months later and um, their awareness and their visibility into the actual, what the providers are doing. And then the incentive structures around like affordability and help and cost savings, um, you, you know, there, there are things that will save money, but then it's like, well, who's going to pay for that? Um, you know, are the providers going to pay for that? And this, and that res could result in a short-term hit to their revenues. And we like to think that at the end of the day that, you know, we're all kind of motivated for patient outcomes, but I think there's this near term, um, you know, hospitals have to make these decisions or providers have to make these decisions about like, okay, so 
am I going to cut off my access to revenue so I can do this, make this system change? Um, so, so I think that's part of why you see this drag. Um, right. And, and unfortunately, you know, a lot of times as investors, we end up like, I think Jenny gets to do some of the cool stuff. But here we're in like the bowels of like the payment, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, Roger, to that point, though, I'd say that, um, you know, the Affordable Care Act actually was an impetus for uh, collaboration between payers and providers. And, and in fact, we have seen uh, risk sharing and new payment models and value-based care and where the incentives are aligned. And I think that's also a key component to uh, creating change and and uh, improving quality and outcomes. If you're if you're if you're taking risk, and it's based upon quality and outcomes, um, you know that that's that's a differentiator. So I, I think that also is going to be it is very helpful to where we're taking this over the next you know five ten years. And I've got a question. I know we've got some some great things uh, popping up in the chat as well, and I, I do want to address those. Um, but just wanted to kind of think a little bit about to the whole impact management project sort of ABC categorization. And I hopefully some on the call uh, who joined us are, are familiar with that. But sort of A is act avoiding harm, B is benefiting stakeholders, C is contributing to solutions, right? And I think a lot of times us as imp the impact investors we talk to are kind of think they fit squarely in that C category. Um, and then sometimes impact can be squeezed out, right, by maybe taking a, an A company and moving it closer to a C, right? And so I wanted to know kind of what is that bag of carrots and sticks that might be able to be applied um, with a company um, that would kind of enhance the impact that might not otherwise be there. And that I think also speaks to the additionality or the fund manager contribution to impact in this case. And I think you all have some experience with that, but maybe Jenny, you can talk a little bit about how you approach that at Adjuvant. Yeah, sure. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I li like to say this, but I stand on the shoulders of giants and this playbook that Adjivin uses to increase its global health impact comes from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, where I came from. But um, we essentially, for every single one of our portfolio companies, ask them to uh, sign a legally binding global access agreement. Uh, and this global health agreement essentially uses a carrot and a stick approach. The the stick is that, um, you know, they're pricing, uh, quantity, manufacturing, fulfillment, um, physical access, registration, licensures, all those commitments that a company will make to us. And so that's the, that's the stick because these are legally binding commitments and there are consequences if those things don't happen. And then the carrot approach is um, we are, get our hands dirty and and to one of the comments I just saw in chat about, you know, more intentional matchmaking within global health partners, that's exactly what Adjuvant does. So if, for an example, we are working with a women's health or contraceptive company, and they mostly have a commercialization engine in the U.S., we may want to pair them with DKT and PSI and all the stakeholders in the family planning space to be the commercial partner in lower and middle income countries. And we are very deliberate in these things, and we form... Um, what we call them joint steering committees and global access committees. Um, but we roll up our sleeves and, and do all the, 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 the matchmaking that needs to happen on the ground level. Um, and we totally recognize that it's extraordinarily challenging. Um, and, you know, but, but I also think to myself, like, if I think about all the challenges, like I wouldn't be able to get out of bed in the morning. And so we're just trying to tackle it one challenge at a time, you know, get some low hanging fruit, quick wins so that we can demonstrate to the broader global health community that some of these things can work. Great. And Roger or James, any, anything you'd like to add in terms of uh, how, you know, that bag of carrot and sticks that you apply or how you think about um, you know, and even like, I know, for example, in, in your case, Roger, actually, you know, the impact engine portfolio is, you know, maybe about a quarter or approaching a quarter healthcare uh, investments, but you also invest in other sectors as well. And I'm just kind of curious also over the last year and a half, you know, are there lessons learned from COVID? Or are there things that have been happening? Like, how do you, you know, that you've applied with that health lens, looking at your other portfolio companies, for example? <clears throat> but squeezing that extra impact out from a healthcare perspective, whether it's a health investment or perhaps not a health investment, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I, I like to think of, you know, we partner with our companies, so, so I don't think we wield too much of a stick. 
other than I, I guess the threat of no funding. Um, but when we develop our investment thesis, you know, one of the things we really is super important to us is the impact metrics that we report on are aligned with their KPIs or ideally are the KPIs of the company right. so that it's not like something bespoke that they have to calculate or um, has ambiguity in it. That was a concern because, like I said, they're early stage companies and sometimes, you know, numbers can sound good, but they might not be grounded in reality. And so um, we actually don't have huge amounts of in specific measures. Uh, we like them to be this a small number, a handful that they pay attention to all the time. Um, and then, you know, in terms of our support is we strategize to help them kind of grow those. I mean, that's, that's the goal. You know, I was thinking about the impact to COVID, um, you know, it was obviously such a huge disruption. Um, and, and what was surprising, I guess, and this is maybe something that's kind of challenging for the, maybe the startup community in general, is it felt like through it all, most of the companies with actually governmental support like PPP loans or um, other th other resources were able to kind of come out of it stronger. Um, and, and I don't know if we've actually done a full postmortem on, on exactly why companies have come out of it strong because we're, we're not done yet, un unfortunately. Um, but, but I do think a certain level of resilience was required um, to make it through. And, and I think that's what we've seen. James, how about from your perspective? I mean, you're a later, you know, you're a later stage investor, um, and kind of thinking about COVID and like what is what is sticky, if you will, to use a common term, right, around like some of the phenomena that we're seeing and some of the big changes, and um, what's what kind of as you look to like the next five years, let's say, kind of what are the things um, from your vantage point as a later stage investor that are make you particularly hopeful or uh, you know big fundamentals ground shifts that you might be seeing. Well, uh, we, we are later stage, as you know, we're, we, we invest in growth stage companies, so they're not early, uh, but at the same time, they're not yet scaled. And, and so we want to be careful not to um, burden the companies uh, with, with too much extra effort. Uh, and to, to Roger's point, I think we really try to work within their uh, KPIs as best as possible as it relates to kind of tracking and measuring and reporting. Um, but we also engage very early and upfront. We talk about you know the the opportunity and the benefits and um, the culture that they can help to create when they're thinking uh, about impact and and the lens of impact. And it it really does position them uh, for success. We think in the future uh, as well as they think about maybe. Uh, transitioning into the public markets and, and having all of that kind of infrastructure and culture lined up around ESG. There are real tangible benefits uh, today to, to those kinds of uh, elements and uh, access to capital should increase uh, to the extent that, you know, you're, you're, you're positioning yourselves um, effectively. And, um, you know, it's also something helpful to, to share with customers and, and clients, the narrative around um, the good work that you're doing and the technology, uh, uh, the technological benefits and so forth. So, you know, we, we like to have that, those discussions and make it easy on them. I'm, I'm very hopeful uh, about the next five years because there seems to be a broad based sort of tailwind for these kinds of activities uh, across the capital markets and uh, in the public markets, as well as now in the private markets. And, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm excited about what lies ahead. And I think people recognize that uh, there is value uh, to doing these things that we're talking about uh, to position them for further success in the future. Great. Jenny, you want to sort of, as we're approaching the end of the session here, wanted to also give you an opportunity to share kind of what that next five years might look like from your perspective and kind of what gives you hope, what gives you pause, and maybe and even kind of Go forward to say like, are there maybe is there one big thing that you would advise everybody on this call? Sort of, if you want, to, if you're an inspiring healthcare impact investor, to kind of keep in your back pocket, to use as that as that sniff test as you're approaching an opportunity. 
Yeah, um, I, I think for me, um, this renowned focus on infectious disease and how global health is truly global, meaning that you can't just solve a health issue in one neighborhood or in one country and not solve it elsewhere. I, I think COVID has really, really, really put that at the forefront of not just kind of the nation's psyche, but um, investors' mindset, investors' investors' mindset, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I think when you have kind of this renewed attention and almost a cause-driven attitude, um, great things will, will happen. Um, and I'm seeing that a little bit right now, right? Because um, I was on another panel on just broadly antimicrobial resistance and how do you actually build up the pipeline for antibiotics. And this has nothing to do with you know this particular panel, but there are now kind of push and pull mechanisms, new push and pull mechanisms that are coming from the US government, the UK government. Um, and it's all trying to address some of these root cause issues of sustainability and who pays for what, who gets to benefit from, from profits um, and how much profit is, is, is reasonable. And to even have some of those discussions, to have this notion that you need these whole mechanisms in place that was spurred by COVID, that was spurred by some of the other kind of major global health challenges that we're facing right now, that gives me hope. Um, and, and I think um, you know that you know as a as a, a still emerging manager a young investment fund um i think that then create that is that gives us a pipeline that gives us um a, a kind of a cause to recruit the best talent into the firm etc cetera, etc cetera. so awesome and roger what about you what does that five-year outlook look like for you and i mean i know like you know some of the trends from COVID. we see like an explosion of mental health startups and so on right there's sort of all these sort of intersectional kind of epidemics and pandemics and and things like that i mean even jenny your point around climate you know around healthcare investing being you know affecting it's there's it's borderless right and climate change is borderless and so many of these issues are but you know roger what do you what does that look like for you in the next five years and what are the ground shifts that you see uh i mean that's a that's a big question <laughs> uh I mean, I, one of the things I wanted to say is I'm, I'm really appreciative of the, the questions and comments in the chat room. It was it was sort of super high quality and super engaging. It was like very thought provoking. I've been like reading these questions over and over and really thinking like, do I have an answer for that? Um, I mean, I think more specifically, I feel like the timing is good for um, solutions that work to scale. I think there, there's an openness. Um, we're excited about one of our portfolio companies called Work at Health. They have what we feel like is a pretty groundbreaking um, addiction treatment product um, that is very effective, very cost effective, um, and is kind of unlocked because of new rules around telehealth. And we do feel like you know their ability to grow is super fast, um, which is kind of interesting that the pandemic has kind of set the stage for people to be open to be like, here's something innovative that works. Let's really accelerate the growth of that. Um, and I think there's investor appetite to support companies to do that. Um, and so I'm excited about being able to kind of just things that work have an opportunity to grow fast. And I think that that's that's super exciting, especially because you know every day their reach expands is more of an opportunity to save lives. Yeah, sometimes small is beautiful, and, and sometimes small is beautiful, but still always still small, right? So those questions of scale, right? I think that that is um, so essential when we think of because we're we're investing, right? And I think we we ultimately, right, we have a, a great solution. You want it to scale. Um, and you can create a lot of impact that way as well. I know we're at time. I wanted to thank everybody in the chat. Really fascinating conversation. Great questions. I echo that, Roger. James, Jenny, Roger, thank you so much. We could talk for a lot longer on this. Really appreciate your joining us.